sorry for the rough transition. We uh, we're using a different GoToWebinar account than we've used in the past. So um, again, here's a uh, welcome to the webinar, and we'll be Matt Cedarberg, Sky Greenwalt, and Colin Smith, who will be your hosts today. Um, and, and here's the webinar agenda. So before we turn the time over to Sky, some um, some housekeeping. First of all. If you've been to a T-Swans webinar before, then you know what we, what makes these webinars successful is um, the chat stream that we have going on dur during the webinar. You are all muted, but you can type in questions, and we have staff here to type back answers during the discussion. And I'll be doing a lot of the answering myself while Sky is presenting. So you asking questions will not disrupt the flow at all. This webinar will be slightly different from our previous ones. We'll have a longer PowerPoint session as we explain these concepts before we bring it all together in a demo. So please type in questions if anything is unclear or if Sky explains something in a good way that you've always wondered about. We'd like to hear that too. And yes, this will be recorded and we'll post a link online when it's done. So with that, let me uh, turn the mic over to Sky. All right. And Matt, just verify really quick that you can hear me? Yep, you're good. Great, okay. Let's advance the slide here. There we go. And stand by while I get to our slide. There we go, okay. Um, so, uh, as Matt said, my name is Sky Greenwald. I'm a partner at School Street Design Company here in Santa Cruz, California. And um, this slide just shows some of the recent work that I've been doing uh, involving T-splines. Uh, primarily, I end up doing a lot of work in the transportation uh, segment, uh, both aircraft and automotive. And so here's just a couple projects that I've done as of late uh, using T-splines. I'm a big T-splines fan. Uh, I've been using it for about three years now um, from version one on the Rhino platform and uh, just really, uh, really love what I can do with T-splines and how it augments uh, NURBS modeling for me. Okay, so moving on. So the, the title of this presentation is Transitioning from NURBS to T-splines. So uh, when I came to T-splines first, I had no background in subdivision modeling. And T-splines is a little bit of a funny hybrid in that you're going to be creating NURB surfaces, but you're going to be creating them often in a manner that looks like the type of workflow or process that you'd go through if you're using a subdivision modeler. Now, if what I just said makes absolutely no sense to you, then you are in the exact right place because you are where I was about three years ago, having no experience with subdivision modeling and really just you know, having gotten my feet wet a couple years earlier with NURBS modeling. And so I can really remember spending about the first six months staring at T-splines going, I know this is going to do what I want it to do, but man, I have no idea what I'm doing here, right? Really just sort of fumbling around in the dark. Um, and so the goal of this webinar is to really create a square one for the people that are coming from any NURBS platform to transition to T-splines, and, and we're trying to ease that transition and, and help you along the way. And so the things that we're going to cover today are really some of just the absolute bedrock fundamental basics of, of what you need to know to understand and start using T-splines. Okay. So um, what are T-splines in a nutshell? It's a, a really nice CAD technology, you can create nice, smooth, high quality, organic models. Uh, they're By definition, they're watertight. This is very nice uh, when you need to deliver a, a watertight surface. Um, and T-Splines allows you a, a different workflow, a different process from your standard NURBS modeling packages. Um, oftentimes, when you're working in, in a, a standard NURBS modeler, you're going to make your major surfaces first, and then you're going to create blends and junctions between them. And with T-splines, you can start with your blends and junctions, or you can start with your main surfaces. And then once you join them together, the, the really the big difference with T-splines, what makes it so different and, and really nice and powerful, is that uh, the model is a unified whole. Uh, 
Um, so that means that any edit that you make to one part of the model is going to get seamlessly integrated into the surrounding geometry. That for me is, is the biggest, most important thing about the, the why. Why do I care about T-splines? What does T-splines do for me? It, it allows me to make these models that are unified and therefore much, much more easily editable and, and refinable. Okay, so we've already seen with the T-splines implementation on the Rhino platform that it's been adopted across a whole host of different applications, consumer products. A lot of people are doing some amazing stuff with jewelry with it, uh, toys and furniture. Um, my personal favorite being automotive and aerospace. Um, but what you can see is that really the anywhere where you would want to do high quality surface modeling, you can use T-splines. Okay, so control points. Uh, we're going to start this first section just talking about control points, and, and it, it's worth saying, like, why are we talking about something as basic as the control point? And the reason is this, is that in order to get the absolute most power out of your T-spline modeling experience, um, you want to create models that have just barely enough control points to do what you want to do. Because what that does for you is that that makes your model so much more easily editable, so much more powerful, so that you can take something and transform it into something else, or modify it, or tweak it, or add something to it. And so a lot of times, people coming from the NURBS background, myself included, um, were often very kind of hesitant to point edit their surfaces, partially because a lot of times when you make surfaces in NURBS packages, they're very dense. Um, and, and partly because you're so used to simply relying on things like blends and fillets and, and network surfaces and other such things to make you know junctions and, and, and you know uh, uh, join your surfaces together. And in T splines, uh, by definition, the model can be joined together. And so it's really in your best interest to understand at the fundamental level, at the, at the most basic, what control points do, how they do it, and by leveraging that, what you'll find is that you can greatly simplify your T-spline models. Okay, so enough of that, let's get into it. Okay, at the most very basic level, um, we're going to start with curves. So a NURBS curve, um, going from left to right here, you know, you've got a straight line segment because you've got two points, you've got something that looks like an arc, we've added a point, you know, each one of these from left to right, you add a point, and you can increase the complexity of the shape by doing that. Okay, very, very basic. The other thing to think about with NURBS curves is curvature, like how, how tight is the curvature or how kinked is that curve? Um, and the way that you can achieve that in NURBS curves mm -hmm. is by placing your control points closer together or farther apart. So in this example on the left here, we've got our control points nice and clustered, and we get a nice little kink. In our, in our line right here, and here we've got them farther apart, and uh, it's a much more open curve. Now, notice that the number of control points is identical, right? And so, when I start thinking about what I want a blend to look like in T-splines, I think about, like, well, how close together should those control points be relative to my surface? And so, this is a very important concept to keep in mind. Um, the other thing that's really critical, and I already hit on this, is that you need to think about, you know, how many points do I really need? Um, and and what, what's going to be the, you know, the downside of having too many points? If you look at this curve on the left here, if I was to grab, you know, if I, if I wanted to sort of reshape this curve to have a higher arch to it, I would have to grab all of these points or scale them or do something to them, manipulate them, in a smooth, predictable fashion, um, and in order to re-edit this curve. Now, if I've got this curve on the right here, I can grab like two of these points and move them around, and that edit is going to just really seamlessly integrate into the existing curve. And so, you want to think about having your models look like this, like this curve on the right, and not like this curve on the left here. Okay. Uh, the other thing to understand is that NURBS curves don't necessarily pass through the control points 
except at the end of the curve. Um, typically, if they're going to pass through the control point in the middle of the curve somewhere, it's, it's either incidental or you've got a bunch of control points all lined up with each other in a linear fashion. Okay. But typically, only going to pass through the points at the ends of the curves. Okay, and another important concept in T-splines is something that we call the control polygon. And the control polygon is what you get when you draw a polyline through your control points. Um, so you're going to hear about something called smooth mode and boxy mode. Some people sometimes call this the cage. Um, and what you'll see is that when we get into the live demo, I'll switch a lot between the smooth mode and the boxy mode. And so that's just the difference between the control points themselves as a polygon and the smoothed curve or surface that results from those points. So here's another Here's another way of thinking about nerves, or, or really transitioning from standard nerves to T-splines. And so, the the downside, or the or the the sort of the the theoretical or conceptual hump that you have to get over when transitioning to T-splines is the fact that these things that you previously did as multiple parts, uh, you're now going to have to think about them as one unified whole, and how to draw that one unified whole with a, a degree three surface. And so in a lot of NURBS packages, um, and this is just a two-dimensional uh, representation of this, you can of course take this into three dimensions, but if we've got two straight lines and we want to create a blend between them, you can just use blend or fill it or whatever type of command that you want to draw a, a blend between these. Now, what you have is three separate line segments, and there's not really any sort of intelligence typically between them. Um, what you want to do when you're doing T-splines is instead of drawing this as three separate segments, you want to think about it as one single degree three curve, or one single degree three surface. And so this is really a big part of the conceptual leap between T-splines and, or from nerves to T-splines, is that you're going to go from thinking about things as a collection of surfaces to thinking about how they would work if it was one surface. Okay, so taking these two-dimensional concepts and then going up into three dimensions, nerve surfaces are defined by a grid of control points. You've got a well-defined U and V direction. And, and we would say that the topology, we'll get into that more later, is rectangular. Right? A, a nerve surface always has a rectangular orientation of its grid. Uh, and so just as in, so all we're doing here is we're extending those 2D concepts that we just talked about into three dimensions. So I'm going to sort of go through this pretty quickly. When these control points are placed close together, you get tighter curvature. When they're farther apart, smoother curvature. Moving on to the next slide, uh, just as with the curves, they typically don't pass through the control points except at the edges. And then we've got the control polygon or cage, which is the connection, you know, really the, the, the polyline um, or of all the control points. Okay, moving on. So this is really when we start to get into the difference between T-splines and nerves. So let's look at this, let's look at this surface here on the left. This could be a T-spline surface, it could be a nerve surface. And what you see is that for each point, because we've got this rectangular topology, for each point it's connected to four other points. And that is for an interior point in a nerve surface, by definition it has to be that. At the most fundamental level, the difference between T-splines and nerves is that T-splines allows you to have more than four connections to an interior point. Most of these points in the T-spline model, the, the points that we're focusing on today, these are called star points. And uh, there is one other type of point in T-splines, which is called a T-point, and we're going to talk about those in a later webinar. But for now, what we're focusing on is the star points, because when you first start out, um, the, what I found is, is that you really have to sort of 
plan out and know where your start points are going to be. So let's look at this picture here in the center. And if you were to draw this picture in a NURBS modeling package, what you would probably do is draw the sort of the main body of this picture and you draw the handle and then you create some sort of blend between the two, probably by trimming a hole in the picture and maybe trimming a hole in the handle. This is, if you're coming from NURBS, that's, that's exactly how you would think about creating this object. Now, in T-splines, what you're going to do instead is you're going to create one surface. And that one surface is going to be the whole thing all together. And so what you see right here, see where it says star points and, and we've got this little red arrow at the star point here. That's got not, uh, let's see here, one, two, three, four, um, five. It's a... Uh, sort of hiding one of the edges there, but that's got five points connected to it. That's a star point. And so the way to think about star points when you're just starting off is that star points are sort of like the glue that holds your T-spline model together. And what I mean by that is you're going to see them in the areas where typically you would have a blend. Here's another star point up here. Notice that it's happening right around the part where the, the handle branches off from the main body. It's these star points that allow you to create these unified surfaces and, and really that's the real power, in my opinion, of T-splines is the fact that you can create this, you, you, can, you can edit the handle of this jug here and it's going to seamlessly integrate into the blend here, right? So, you can really push and pull on any of these points, change this thing around, and it's going to stay as a unified whole. And so think of the star points as the glue that holds your model together when you first start off. Just like, see this surface on the right here, we've also got star points. And when I get into the demo, you'll see how the star points um, really fundamentally map back to um, that idea of gluing your surface together. Okay, so enough about points. The second part that we want to address from a conceptual standpoint is topology. And so you're going to hear this, this phrase topology a lot um, when you're dealing with T-splines. And so in its most basic form as it applies to T-splines, topology refers to how many control points are in the model and how they're connected to each other. And so what you do with those points doesn't necessarily matter as much as sort of like how the points are, uh, are arranged relative to each other. And what I mean by that is if you look at these four examples down here below, each of these has exactly the same topology. It started here on the left as like a basic cube, okay? But you can see this third example here, we've turned this cube into something that looks like a cylinder. And here on the right, we've turned it into something that looks entirely different from that. I'm not even sure what that is. But you get the idea. With, with NURBS, your input geometry is often what determines your final shape, right? You're going to start with like some curves and you're going to loft them or you're going to sweep them. And then you're going to start building your surface out from there, right? And with T-splines, it really comes down to the topology. It's the topology. It's the relationship of these points and faces and how they're um, oriented relative to each other that allows you to achieve the final shape. And so this is what can be really difficult for people when they're coming from nerves into T-splines is that they're often thinking about the final shape. Instead, what you should be thinking about is how do I structure the topology of my model to allow my final shape. That's really the conceptual leap. And I remember, <laughs> I remember trying to make that leap and, and having a lot of difficulty. So I'm, I'm really hoping that this presentation can help with that. Okay, so as I said before, topology and nerves, it's, it's so straightforward. We almost never discuss it other than to say like, yeah, there's a U direction, there's a V direction to these surfaces. It's rectangular. That being said, even though the NURBS 
topology is rectangular. You can do these things with it, like here on the right, that of course don't look like rectangles at all, like maybe triangular surfaces and toruses and cylinders. But still at the heart of it, what you're dealing with is a, is a rectangular topology. Okay, so with T-splines, we have a lot more freedom with our topology and we can do a lot of different things. Um, because these control points can be connected to a different number of points, you free yourself up to create these unified models, like this, this T here in, this, in the center. These right here, these are the star points. And it's sort of gluing together this part of this model and this part of this model. And so you're going to have four star points all around this T. They're gluing it together. Okay. Um, so another thing to think about with topology is that, see, here on the left, if you did this shape in NURBS, you would probably draw this, this top surface here. You'd create this top surface and you'd maybe trim it. And then you create this sort of side surface here and maybe trim that out as well. Okay. And then you create a fillet or a blend or whatever you want to make to bridge between the two and, and close up that gap, right? And when you go and you turn on the control points for something like this, look at how many control points you have in this, in this blend region, right? Tons and tons of control points. So if you said to yourself, I don't really like the way this thing looks over in here, you know, good luck grabbing a control point and editing that thing. It's going to be really, really difficult to do. With T-spline, so we've made the same type of shape over here, but the whole thing is unified. It's one T-spline surface. And so you can imagine if you wanted to sort of crisp up this edge right here, all you would have to do would be to take the control points in that area and slide them closer to each other. And you could very, very easily crisp up that edge. Okay, uh, and I alluded to this before, in T-splines we've got sort of two different ways of looking at our models. There's smooth mode and there's box mode. When we get to live demo, I'm going to use both. Um, what I found when I started using T-splines was that I was always looking at my models in smooth mode because I figured like, well, that's what I should be looking at. And, and the more that I use T-splines, the more that I typically model almost exclusively in box mode, and then I might make one or two little tweaks in smooth mode. Um, and the reason is that it's a lot easier to see what's going on with your topology in box mode often, especially when your models start to get really dense and complicated. It can be a lot easier to tell what's going on in box mode. And so um, I remember that, that inclination to be, you know, working on your models in smooth mode. And what I would suggest to new users to, is to try to use box mode as much as you can. Okay, so I came up with this little sort of phrase a while back almost as a joke, and then I realized that it actually had some wisdom in it, which was to respect the rectangle, right? I'm always saying respect the rectangle. And, and what this means is T-splines is going to give you the freedom to have these different numbers of connections from each internal control point. But at the end of the day, you should still try your level best to make everything that you can in a rectangular topology. Your life is just going to be easier that way. Okay, so here on the left, we've created this sort of flat two-dimensional face layout. And, and a lot of times when I'm modeling something, I'll start with a two-dimensional layout and I'll think about where my star points are going to be or, or sort of how the surfaces will, or the faces of my model will connect to each other, okay? And you can see we've got tons and tons of triangular faces in this thing. And what you can see on the right is there, there's a solution to this that doesn't involve any triangular faces whatsoever. And so I would always, always encourage people to um, respect the rectangle, to really keep your faces quad. So you might have more than uh, four points connected to any given point, okay? But, or, or fewer, you could have three like right here. But at the end of the day, your model is going to behave better 
if you keep your faces rectangular. So it's, it's really important to still sort of think about these things in a rectangular fashion. Okay, so a little bit of uh, review here. Um, star points allow you to create more complex surfaces and are connected to three, five, or six, or even more points. So like here on the left, this right here is our star point, and you're going to have four of them all around here. And then the same thing on the cap of this thing, you're going to have four star points all around there. And, and so this is, this is an extrusion off of a surface, and we're going we're to actually do this as a little very, very basic demo um, in the beginning of the live demo and talk a little bit more about that. Um, so you can see here, you know, again, if I was going to make this out of nerves, I would make a plane and a plane and maybe a cylinder here in the middle, and then I'd come up with some sort of way of blending them together. With T-splines, you can make this as, as one unified surface, and you've got four star points around the base here and four star points around the top here. And again, that just sort of goes back to my, my sort of conceptual crutch that the star points are like the glue that holds your model together. Okay, so really the power of T-splines, like I said, is that you can make these complex shapes as one single surface, like this beautiful chair right here. This is one T-spline surface, and so you can, you can make all sorts of edits and changes and tweaks to this thing, and it's going to stay whole, it's going to stay watertight, and, and it's going to, um, your edits are going to sort of seamlessly integrate into the surrounding geometry. Something like this is a, is a total textbook perfect application for T-splines. Okay, so one thing that I do when I model something for the first time is I like to think about, um, you know, where are my star points going to be? That's the first thing that I always ask myself when I make any model, is where can I expect to see my star points? Where, where do I need to sort of glue this thing together? And, you know, one way to think about that is, like I said, if, if you were making this out of nerve surfaces, well, where would those blends and junctions of those nerve surfaces be? And so from the most basic level, if I have a bunch of rectangular topology in here for this hand, well, then I'm going to end up branching off of this thing for the thumb right here. And let's just, and, and literally, this is what I do. I will get out pencil and paper when I model something for the first time, and I'll just kind of map out where do I think these star points are going to be. And right here would be a star point, because we're going to branch this thumb off of here. Likewise, with each of these fingers, if we just draw them all as one big rectangle, you're going to have a star point here, and you're going to have a star point here. Uh, my sketching skills leave a ton to be desired. This is why I draw things in the computer. Um, with this phone here, you might have a nice thin row of faces right along here. And actually, we're going to make this right here out of two faces. And then you might have another face along here. And then at some point, you're going to want to branch off into this part of the headset. And so what you might have is you might have like a face coming up here, and a face coming across the phone here, okay? And then a face coming like this. And notice what we have here is we've got a star point. So somewhere in this area here, we can expect to have a star point in our model. And so it's really, really helpful, especially when you're first starting out, and I still do it now, three years into this, to just kind of map out in a real two-dimensional fashion um, how you would uh, make these surfaces, just, just with rectangles, purely with rectangles. Okay, moving on. So final advice. Um, a lot of what I do is, is a mix of nerves and T-splines. And so 
Um, we're not saying that T-spines is going to completely replace nerves. No, 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 no. It, it's a wonderful extension of nerves. Um, and so what I find in a lot of the models that I do is I end up mixing nerves and T-splines 50-50, um, give or take, somewhere about that. Um, and so some things like there was a aircraft at the beginning on uh, the intro slide. Um, I modeled an aircraft nose a while back, and I've been repurposing that nose on a number of different airplanes. Um, and so that's one of those things with T-splines where you can start with an existing model, and because it's unified, um, because it's, it's one surface, you can very easily take you know, this sort of basic shape and then tailor it to each specific application. Um, so really, uh, what I typically do with T-splines is I make, my, I make the outer surface of my, of my model with T-splines. And then I end up converting it to nerves and then doing all my detail work in nerves. That's, that's a pretty typical workflow. Okay. Live demo. All right. So let's change the presenter. Okay. Sky, you made it. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I, just, just to add a note, I, uh, the, those, those two principles that Sky talked about, the control points and the topology, and um, Sky taking the time to kind of lay out the topology on that model, are things that, uh, um, yeah, I, I think those are really powerful concepts. So hopefully those will be a good fundam fundamental for everyone using T-splines. And Matt, can you just verify that you can now see my, my uh, screen? I see the Eggman, yep. The Eggman, okay. <laughs> the Eggman. Um, okay, so, uh, so we're going to go through just the absolute most basic modeling approach in T-splines, which is where I would suggest that people who are coming from the nerve side start. Um, we used to have in our household this little single egg microwave egg cooker um, that had a little base and a funny face on it. And we always thought it was kind of funny because you put them in the microwave and you watch them spin around and he looked really thrilled to be in the microwave. Um, and so I was trying to come up with something that would be like really simple and easy to demonstrate just with fewest commands possible, the power of T-splines. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do my, my own version of this little microwave egg cooker. And so this is kind of our, this, this is our goal for this little live demo, is to make this little, this little egg man, as we've been calling him. Okay. But I'm going to start just by demonstrating some of the very basics here. Um, I'm going to make a T-spline face, okay, or just a, a surface. And so here's a three by three T-spline surface. And I click on any of these faces, and I can bring up a manipulator where I can, I can move this face. I can, I can scale it. Okay. I can rotate it. I can do any number of things. But at the end of the day, this surface right here, this three by three grid T-spline surface, there's nothing here that you can't do with nerves. This is essentially a nerves surface. No difference. But let's do the most basic thing that we can do with T-splines, which is to grab a face or a group of faces and to extrude them. And by extruding, we're going to be adding geometry to this model. And so I hold down the Alt key. I'm going to grab this arrow right here. And I'm going to extrude this upwards. OK. So what we've just done is we've created this, this extrusion out of the middle of this face. And what you can see is that we've added star points to this model. And then you can take this and do all sorts of you know, uh, manipulations to it. You can scale it and twist it and rotate it and move it. And you can imagine if you had to make this in NURBS, let me show you what you'd have to do. So I'm going to take this, and one of the things about T-splines is that you can seamlessly back convert them to NURBS, just with a button click. So I'm going to convert this to a NURBS poly surface. And if I wanted to make exactly this layout in NURBS, let me show you what you'd have to do. You'd have to match up at the edges 13 different subsurfaces. Okay. 
And so, and look where these subsurfaces break down. They break down where the star points were. And so this is what I say when I mean, or this is what I mean when I say that the star points are like the glue that holds your model together. Um, the star points are going to show up in the areas where typically you have multiple nerve surfaces meeting with each other. Okay. So that's really just the, the, the most basic thing that you can do. And so I'm going to make this Eggman, and I'm going to do it um, just with extruding and manipulating points. That's it. So I'm going to start with a primitive. And now, when I said at the beginning that T-splines is a little bit like a subdivision modeling package, this is what I mean. And, and, and this is where it's fine if you have absolutely no subdivision modeling experience. When you start with a primitive, you're going to start with something that's a basic shape that you can transform into your final shape. In this case, I'm making an egg. I'm going to start off with something that looks like a sphere. Now, there's something very interesting about this sphere, and that is, oh, and so this is, I talked about smooth mode and boxy mode. And so here you go, smooth mode and boxy mode. I'm just toggling between the two of them here. We've got the locations of our points and then we've got our final surface. There you go. Notice, though, I could have made this sphere in a different way. There's two different ways of making a sphere here in T-Splines. Here's the other way of doing it. And this looks just like a nerve sphere in that you've collapsed all the points on the top and the bottom here. You've just manually collapsed them in space. So this has a bunch of triangular faces. The one that I want to use is something called a quad ball. The quad ball strictly has rectangular faces. And I like it because I like to keep my, all my faces rectangular. So here's what I'm going to start with. I'm going to grab this thing, and I'm just going to scale it up so that it's roughly egg-shaped. And this is how we start by working from our primitive. And then, if you remember on the final shape, we've got some eyeballs and a mouth and a base. There's not enough control points here to actually adequately describe that. And so something that you can do in nerve surfaces is that you can always add control points without changing the shape. You can do the same thing here in T-splines. There's a subdivide exact function. And just the voice of experience tells me I want to do this twice. I should also mention in T-splines, there's a nice, really nice symmetry function. And so you see this green line right here down the middle. What that green line is doing is that's the line of symmetry on my model. You can see anything I do on one side, it gets reflected on the other. OK, so I've got my basic egg shape, and I've got what I think are probably enough points to make my the, the features that I want. And so I'm going to grab these eight points right here, and I'm going to start by using these to model the eyeballs. And so I'm going to hold down the Alt key, and I'm going to extrude inwards, just like that. Boom. Now, once you start using T-splines, you're pretty much going to start seeing the entire world as just a collection of extrusions. You just you take your model and you extrude it. Almost every feature you can think of as an extrusion. And now, so. I've created this little well for the sort of sunken eyeballs, and now I want to create each individual eyeball. Again, I'm just going to extrude. And then I'm going to move these eyeballs out a little bit. I'm going to grab a point. I'm going to move that point out a little bit. Let's see what we have. Toggle in the smooth mode. Hey, look at that. We're starting to get something that looks like little eyeballs. And you know what's so nice about this is that there's so few points that are really determining the shape of this thing, you can really sculpt it and mold it very easily. Like if I thought, you know, these points down here, um, let me deselect that. Um, I want to round this thing a little more down here. Well, boom, there you go. Now we've kind of rounded this edge. And I like to take these right here and just bring these down a little bit. There we go. Now, I had these sort of, I don't know if they were brows or eyelids. I think they're eyelids. 
They just look cute. Again, all I do is hold down the Alt button. In that case, I scaled inwards. And then you just bring this out. Let's go smooth. Boom. We've got these little chubby eyelids that sit on the top of this guy's eyeballs. Let's do the mouth. Again, the mouth is just an extrusion. I hold the Alt key. I grab this arrow right here. I bring it in. Notice that it's a little bit slower to do stuff in smooth mode. Um, this is a, a real reason why I prefer working in, in box mode, is that it's just it's much, much faster. So now I'm going to extrude inwards once more. And I have the beginnings of my mouth. Now this guy right now is neither happy nor sad. Let's give him an expression. Let's take these edges right here, and let's just move them upwards. Let's take these edges right here. Let's move them down. And let's take these four edges up here all together. Let's give them a big old smile. Now, remember what I said before about how you're going to control your curvature by bringing your control points closer or farther together. If I want more of a crease here in this mouth, or less of a crease, let's start with less of a crease, I just bring that thing down. If I want to get this thing nice and pointy, boom, I've got this nice pointy mouth. And all I've had to do is just move a couple of control points. Yeah, and just, Sky, just to cut in, this is um, an example of those basic concepts that Sky was teaching earlier, how the principle of understanding that where control points are closer together, it makes header curvature. I mean, it's a basic concept, but it really impacts your entire T-spine's workflow. Absolutely, absolutely. And so the other thing, you know, we've been talking about star points. Everywhere where I've extruded, you end up having a star point. So here's a star point here. Here's a star point here. Um, here's a star point here. Uh, we've got some star points that are forming the caps of the eyeballs. But what you can see is that when you just start extruding, uh, the star points sort of happen automatically. Okay, so to finish this thing off, Let's give this thing a little base to stand on. Let's just grab some of these faces in here. And, yep, okay. And again, all I'm gonna do is just extrude. I'm gonna bring up my scale manipulator. I'm gonna zero out the vertical scale here so that these faces are all now coplanar with each other. I'm going to extrude downward once more. Now I'm going to scale it out so I get a little bit of a thicker base, something a little wider. And then I'm going to scale down twice more. Simple as that. Toggle this thing smooth and we've got our little egg man. Now let's say you wanted to crisp up this edge on the bottom here. All you'd have to do is just move this set of control points down. Look at that. Really intuitive. Let's say your customer says, I don't like how big this needs to be smaller. You can just grab those points and scale them inwards. Vice versa, you can scale them out. Let's say the customer says, oh, this is actually a deviled egg maker. So let's get in the spirit of that. Let's put some little horns on this guy. Let's make, let's make it a, a microwave deviled egg maker. You can just take this bring it up, and maybe scale these in, and okay. toggle it smooth. So <laughs> Sky warned me that if I didn't cut in, he would uh, add accessories to the Eggman for a few hours. So That's true. I could do this all day. Sky, so. that, that looks great. <laughs> um, so yeah, why well, don't I hand it back to you guys, and, and we can uh, you guys can do the demo of the uh, Autodesk implementation. Cool. Looks great. Okay, this guy, thanks a lot for introducing, yeah, the, the basic concepts of T-spines, control points, and topology. And now we'll uh, turn the mic over to Colin Smith uh, from Autodesk. Hello.
Okay. I can hear you, Colin. You can. Perfect. Yep. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Colin Smith. I'm a product manager at Autodesk, currently working in the manufacturing uh, group with the emerging products and technology. Um, prior to being a product manager for this group, I was a product manager for Alias. So I've been with uh, the Alias uh, company since 94, and uh, I've been a product manager for the Alias product line of tools uh, off and on since about 2000. Um, what I'm here to show you today is uh, a little bit of a technology preview. Uh, I'm going to show you T-splines running on uh, the Inventor Fusion platform. On a, it's actually on a platform that we call Neutron, which is a new platform that Autodesk is developing for uh, new products. And uh, what we wanted to do here is uh, basically take the in existing Inventor Fusion product uh, with its solid modeling capabilities and add T-splines to the front end of it so that we could create uh, organic shape and forms using the T-splines uh, tools and then switch over to solid modeling so that we could do solid modeling operations on the same uh, geometry. Actually, not the same geometry. We do have to do some steps to get to uh, the point where we're going to uh, do some solid modeling. But I'll show you a little bit of what we've got working so far. I'm going to do the uh, disclaimer that this is prototype software. So I've been wrestling it with it all morning. I've, this is my second version I've installed today. So it's, uh, it may may be happy. You might get to see our new crash error reporting system at work. We'll see how it goes. Uh, what you're looking at right now is um, our user interface into the uh, Inventor Fusion platform. And here we've got uh, our workspaces. Um, anyone who's used Inventor Fusion is probably used to seeing this workspace. This is our solids area. So all the tools in our workspace that apply to the solid modeling uh, reside there. And we've also got some uh, options areas. Again, a lot of this is uh, is all prototype software, so this is not how a final product would normally look. But uh, we've got surface area, and we've got uh, our T-spline. So you can see here we have all the T-spline tools uh, available. And the way that this works is I can drop down into these menus, and I can pull up, uh, activate different uh, tools. I can go down, and uh, if I want to have a, a activated tool, I can select it. If there's a tool I use quite a bit, let's take the Taurus, for instance, I can drag that up into the window space so I have quick access to those tools. And that's the same along here. On my left-hand side, I have a browser. And the browser contains information about my model as I build it, and also things like units, and origins. And as I build more of my model, and you'll see things come down. Now, uh, right now, T-spline models don't show up in this. Only uh, solid bodies do and, and uh, solid surfaces. So you'll see those come up as I work. Uh, on this. We also have symmetry and construction tools. In the right hand side we have an Autodesk tool we call the View Cube and the View Cube helps me orientate my uh, my session to see what I'm looking at. And at the bottom I have all my pan, zoom, uh, orbit tools, uh, look at tools and, and those can also be controlled of course by my mouse and uh, using the three button mouse, uh, sorry the two button mouse and a scroll bar. So what I'll do is I'll just quickly uh, open up uh, start with a box, and uh, you can see as I navigate around, I'm I'm asked to select a plane that I want to put this on. Now, the funny thing about this this morning is it's not showing the interactivity of the actual window. What would normally happen is you would put down in the center and expand out, and you get a, a box that shows you the relative size you're starting with. And then once you pull up to extrude the box, you can see this is uh, typical T-splines, as you see in uh, in Rhino today. Uh, what we've added, though, is the ability to interactively change things on the fly as you are building your primitives. And uh, so you can do a couple of things. You can enter in length and width and height right here uh, in the box. Or uh, you can uh, enter in like segments, and you can invoke symmetry automatically if you want to. But we also have handles uh, on the geometry. And this little guy we call the mini dialog box comes up. So if you want to change things on the fly, you can do that here. Um, I can delete that out and then make that three and that changes it or I can drag these manipulators here and they will also change uh, interactively the way I want my uh, my primitive to look and I can also enter in values if I want absolute values for different things. Right now I'm working in millimeters but that can be changed uh, to uh, any number of different uh, centimeters or inches or feet depending on what scale you want to work in. So that's uh, there's my basic primitive. And uh, 
you know, all the tools here, similar to, I think we have the majority of the tools that we have in the Rhino implementation, with the exception of some things like pipe are not here, but, you know, we can edit the form, we can do extrusions, insert points, weld points, anyone who's familiar with using Rhino will recognize a lot of these. And um, I can take uh, something like this and invoke symmetry on it, so I'm just going to say I want symmetry across that, and again, you see the familiar green line like you saw in Sky's demo. And uh, I'll do a quick edit form on here just to show you, again, some of the things we're doing as far as user interface is concerned. So you can see this is a, an older version of this triad, and you'll see we switch it over when I move it to the solids. But the basic idea is that we wanted to have a lot of your tools available for you to manipulate uh, the sub-D model as you're working on it. So we have the ability to pull it uh, in several directions based on the, uh, the axes. We can also um, scale it. And we can do non-proportional scales in several directions too, so I can non-proportionally scale it up. Uh, I can move it around based on different ax uh, axes also, and I can do rotate. So this was the idea was to have a lot of these tools available for you so that you could move and rotate and then scale and do all these things at the same time without having to worry about switching between tools. And of course, I also have some other tools here. I can change things like uh, world space, view space, UNV space and I can change my selection filter so I'm only selecting vertexes, edges, or faces. Now this is an older version cut, and even the newer version that was out today that uh, was actually acting a little finicky, so I switched over. Um, the, the mini dialog box will also show up for you in a lot of cases. Uh, you can uh, then select and, uh, and change things on the fly. One of the other things that we have in the software is uh, marking menus. Marking menus is something we've had in Alias for a number of years and has been propagated to a lot of the Alias, to the Autodesk product line. And uh, you'll notice here that I can, I have full access to the same amount of tools that are up here in the workspace. I can actually switch out workspaces using uh, my marking menus. I can uh, select specific tools, edit form, so I'll click edit form, and then the face, and then I can operate that way. So you can see the, what we're trying to do is allow users to quickly move between operations so they can quickly get the shape and form that they want without having to worry about uh, playing around with the user interface too much. Yeah, just, just to chime in, Colin, those marking menus are something we've always thought are awesome in that view cube. So that's something we're really excited about is, is this user interface possibilities that we have now that it's built on this Autodesk platform. Yeah, and uh, so what I'll do, and I'm going to um, bring in, what I'll do is I'll... Uh, Start a new, take this guy here and uh, delete him. Oops, that didn't work so well. I'm going to just back right out. And I'm going to bring in, uh, I'm going to import the Eggman. Uh, originally, I was planning on showing you the Eggman as the demo, but Eggman and I are not getting along right now. We're having a bit of a tiff. I can bring in, this is, so this is the file that actually was created in the Rhino implementation. And you can see that all of the information that Sky had uh, in there. Uh, has transferred over, so we, we're just, it's just a TSM, so we're reading the TSM file, and uh, everything that's saved in there is shown here. One of the things that you'll see is it's a little bit funky as the orientation is not matching my orientation, but we can fix that here uh, by changing the orientation of my model. Oh, I'm going to go around it the long way, apparently. And then once I've got it the way I want it, that's actually the front. I can go in here and say, well, I really want that to be the front. And so then I don't have to worry about grabbing the model and turning them in seven different directions and worrying about whether I've got it at the right angle. I just changed my space around the model, and then the model and the uh, orientation of the cube match up. Um, I'm not going to use him. The, I, I really want to. I want to show you me using him, but we're not getting along. So what I'm going to show you is actually uh, something that um, when Sky was showing his original model, uh, we practiced this a little while ago, and he showed uh, his little Eggman. I was inspired by that, and um, I have a little M&M dish that sits on my desk, and I feed from it occasionally to keep me, my energy up. And the little M&M &M dish is similar to what the egg guy was, so I created the, um, using the same techniques that Sky did, I, use, I created this little M&M dish. So you've got his, same, his little eyes and his eyebrows, and he's running symmetry through the middle of him. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, Mr. Eminem here, and I'm going to convert him to a B rep. So right now he's a T spline, and I'm going to create him to a boundary representation, and that will um, make him into a solid. 
that I can do a lot of solid uh, operations on. And I don't think that actually worked. I'm going to try one more time. Uh, BRAP, select the entity, and say OK. And done. Boy, that was nice. OK, so now what we're looking at is a boundary representation. Now, there's a step that's not happening yet in this implementation. And what that is, is it's still not seeing as a solid. It's seeing as a stitched. So if I go into bodies now, it's seeing as an unstitched body. That's what this little icon here shows me. So luckily, I can uh, just select this guy and go into stitch. And I'm going to create a new component out of that and say OK. And now I have a fully closed, watertight version of that same m and guy. And uh, I can turn them on and off. And there's a number of different operations you can do uh, in here. But I'm going to now uh, take my guy, and I'm going to do a little bit of solid modeling operations on him. Because the way he looks right now, he won't actually sit on my table. He'll be more of a, a bit of a weeble. So what I'm going to do is select this back plane, and I'm going to create a cutting tool. Uh, that's about right. And I'm going to move this guy. And now you can see that this is the newer version of that same manipulator. So eventually we'll have this set up uh, in that way. But right now this is the way we're working. And I'm going to extrude that so that he's going to cut right through right there. So now he'll sit on the table. So that's a good start. My M&Ms won't fly all over the place. And I'm going to just do a little bit of a uh, round on the end of that. So you can see now it's not a sharp edge anymore. And uh, just uh, quickly, because I know we're quick for time here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this body. So this guy, uh, I'm going to put a cutting tool through here. I'm going to select this component. And we have a tool here called Split Body, because I want to be able to um, make this into two pieces. And my splitting tool is going to be this guy. And now I have two bodies, as you can see. So I have a lower half and an upper half. Now, in the, for the sake of um, time, I'm going to do the old cooking show thing. And I'm just going to show you some things I've already worked on. But I will, uh, you can see how. I'm going to do this a little bit more slowly here. Move. There we go. So this is two separate pieces now. So what I want to do is I wanted to shell this and, and do a few more operations on it. And I have actually done that. Take M and M3 here. So this is the same model. And uh, I've actually gone in and uh, changed the surface material. I'm going to select these. Um, Again, we're using the nice thing about using the uh, Neutron platform is we take advantage of a lot of the same things that we have in some of our other products, and one of those things is Autodesk Materials. So, ideally, in a, when you're working in one environment and you want and you've done a lot of work, so I've changed the color and material properties, I want to be able to bring those over to other products, say Showcase to do visualization, or Maya to do animation, or Alias to do more NURBS modeling around this or including this in my model. And so because we have uh, common components between these software products, um, I, could, I could save these with Autodesk materials and open them up in a product like Maya, and a lot of those would transfer over. So I'm going to change my visual material here to red. And it's not going to do it because I didn't do it right. So I'm going to select that and say red. And I'm select that guy and say I want that to be red. So it's more like the original model. And what I've done here is I've already gone through and shelled this. So I just used the solid shell command to shell at the bottom. And uh, I'll turn off the top so we can actually see that better. There we go. So there's the bottom. So it's just shelled out so that we can actually put the candies in it. And, and then there's the top, which I've created sort of offset the interior and created another piece so that it won't slide around on top. And I haven't gone through the point of shelling this. but um, you know, the nice thing about this being watertight now is I could export this to a rapid prototyper and create a rapid prototype piece and, uh, and have an actual prototype on my desk that I could uh, try out. And uh, what we'd like, we're going to be adding to this, uh, this technical preview is the ability to put uh, decals on here. So if you have an M&M logo you want to put on or uh, create uh, 
eyebrows and eyes and those kind of things so it looks a little bit more like the actual M&M &M guy here. There's actually a lot of graphics that are sort of painted on. And uh, so right now I'd, I'd be able to bring this into another software product and do it, but eventually uh, we'd like the prototype uh, Project Forge to be able to do that also. So uh, that is about it. I'm just really excited about where we are with this right now and the progress we've made. I know um, that uh, Matt has uh, been excited about where we are with this and what we're planning on doing is releasing a technical preview for Forge in the October time frame for you to go to Autodesk Labs and you can download it. Now if you want to play with Fusion today, you can actually go to Autodesk Labs today and Inventor Fusion on the Neutron platform is available there and you can uh, play with the solid modeling pieces. So you'll have the, uh, the solids and surface pieces, but the T-spline pieces won't be there. If you want to just familiarize yourself with the, with the user interface and play with the solid modeling, you can do that. Um, and then in the meantime, in the October time frame, if you, if you go to the uh, Autodesk Labs and sign yourself up, when that is available, we will be able to let you know that it's available for download, and then you can go and try it out and give us your feedback. We'd love to know how the uh, existing T-Splines community feels about how we're doing with uh, T-Splines on the Autodesk platform. Great. Thanks a lot, Colin. So just to, you just barely said this, but there have been a number of questions coming in about um, when people can get their hands on this. So could you just reiterate, do they need to wait? Some was wondering, do we need to wait until March 2013? Or what, when's the date that people can use this? You can actually download the prototype uh, in, in October. So this October, about mid-October, we're going to have this prototype available for download uh, on Autodesk Labs. So if you, if you uh, uh, Google search Autodesk Labs, it will bring you to the uh, Autodesk Labs site. You can register yourself there. Right there, you can also download Inventor Fusion right now, which is the same interface you're seeing now without the T-splines. And then in October, we'll be releasing Project Forge on, the, uh, on Labs, and you can download it and uh, give it a try. Great. Okay, so just Google Autodesk Labs. So there's there's been other questions about T spines and Autodesk. Someone had a uh, Zoha had a question about, or I'm sorry, Antonio had a question about whether they'd be able to use T spines and Alias. What are your thoughts about that, Colin? Well, actually, right now um, you can um, export uh, an STL file, or sorry, a step file from this product and bring it into Alias. I actually had it running a little while ago. Uh, so, you know, I just in step, you can export. Um, what we'd like to do is be able to export a wire file uh, from Project Forge and bring it into Alias. Uh, you know, similarly to how you do these things with Rhino today, we can convert it to a NURBS surface and then export it as a, as a wire file. But right now we don't have that in the prototype, but, but we are hoping that that will make it into the prototype uh, by the time we do the technical preview. But yeah, we see, uh, obviously we want to have a downstream uh, from from Project Forge, so we're going to have the ability, of, you can output this model today, uh, because it's a solid, it will read into Inventor, it'll read into uh, Showcase, it'll read into Maya, um, and also, sorry, not in Maya, but in Showcase and Inventor, and then you can also, uh, once we have the NURBS converter available, you'd be able to bring it into Maya, bring it into, uh, into Alias as a wire file. Great. Great. So, and here's a question from Al. Um, at this point in your model, can you go back into T-splines from the solid modeling object? Not right now. The, uh, the idea for the implementation that we've done so far is that the T-splines model would stay uh, a T-splines model, and when you convert to a B-rep, the B-rep would be a separate model. Um, so you could make changes to your B-rep, to your original T-spline, and then convert it again to a B-rep. Ideally, what we'd like to have happen is that there'd be associativity at the very least, and that and sort of the ultimate version is that the B-rep and the T-spline would be one, and that you'd be able to interactively move between solid modeling commands as well as T-spline commands on the same model. But I think for the, by the time we get to the prototype, what we're looking at is you'd be able to convert an existing T-spline to a B-rep and then do solid modeling on modeling commands on that. Once, if you wanted to make changes to your original T spline, you'd have to go back to that T spline and make your modifications convert it again. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I think that's great that the intent would be to keep that T spline in the scene, though. So that's pretty. That, yeah. We'll definitely keep the T spline. I think ultimately, though, if we're sort of looking at the utopian view, would be that the system doesn't care if it's a T spline or a B rep. Uh, it'll do modeling operations between back and forth. You can move between them. And uh, so that's what we're we're shooting for. Yeah, yeah that will be great. 
Um, just a question. I think a lot of the people on the webinar are kind of new to the Autodesk universe. Just a question. How does Fusion differ from 123D, Colin? Uh, well, 123D is built on an older platform. And uh, 123D is uh, made for um, 123D available on a mobile. I believe it's on a platform that's also on mobile. But it, I, 123D was made on the same platform that the original Fusion was made on. So it's using an older platform. Um, but the idea was similar. 123D is really just a, a sort of a simpler version of Fusion for people uh, to play around with to get used to using solid modeling tools. So they're similar, and uh, you'll see some similarities between the existing Fusion or Fusion, uh, the last release of Fusion, and 123D. But uh, right now, this is just the idea of this right now is just a technical preview. It's just for people to see how we are using T splines, what we're considering. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback as what you think about this as a, a possible product. But right now, it's uh, it's just it's a prototype. We're getting used to T splines. We're trying to understand how it works and how we can implement it into our product line. Great. And then th there's a few other questions as well. So like Natalie is wondering, looking farther down the road, any plans to integrate T-splines into AutoCAD architecture or Revit? Not at this time, although you know it seems to make sense that we would want to uh, propagate T-splines into a lot of different products. But at this point, uh, this is the implementation of T-splines we have today. Great. Um, Okay, so there have been a lot of questions. I, I think we've answered a lot of them, although a lot of them kind of slipped through. So if, if you have a question we haven't addressed, uh, feel free to, to type it in again, and we'll make sure it hasn't slipped. But um, I'd just like to thank Sky for presenting on the t spines Fundamentals, Colin, for being willing to demo software that's still in beta. That's never my idea of a fun time. But... Um, <laughs> But, uh, okay, well, great. So thanks again for attending. It's really good for us to, con to connect with the community again. This webinar will be recorded, and uh, look forward to seeing all of you on um, additional webinars and at the T-Splines Forum.